Well, welcome to uh, today's uh, co-hosted event by the Council of Korean American and Stimson Center. Uh, my name is Abraham Kim. I'm the Executive Director at the Council of Korean Americans. Uh, and I'm so honored uh, to join, be joined with my friend and colleague, uh, Jenny Town, here at the Stimson Center. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, the Council of Korean Americans, we are a network of Korean American uh, national leaders uh, that are working to raise the voice of our community, uh, but also to support uh, future leaders, uh, Korean American leaders, uh, to contribute back to the United States and to, uh, to tackle global problems and to support wonderful Korean Americans like Seth, uh, who's produced this wonderful book uh, during his reporting at the PyeongChang Olympics. Um, <clears throat> I was really struck by this book. Uh, it seems like a very simple book. And when Seth, uh, when we talked about this book, when Seth was about to publish it uh, a number of months ago, uh, he told me that it was about a South Korean women hockey team. And I was like, OK. Uh, uh, and would love to come to DC and, and do something. And But it, on its cover as a book, it seems simple about a hockey team, but there's so much more. Uh, if you scratch uh, beyond the surface and really uh, read deeply, uh, it, is a, it is about a team uh, that was at the nexus of global politics, uh, Korean history, national security, uh, nuclear weapons crisis, sports, multiculturalism, and the drama of human relationships. Uh, it's a, it was a tremendous book. Uh, it is a tremendous book and a tremendous story. And I'm so honored that Seth was able to bring it to print. But on another perspective, this book is about, about women who are outsiders uh, in many ways. Um, some were women who were in, a, in an unpopular sport uh, compared to the male counterpart. They were in a sport that wasn't well supported by family members. There were adoptees. There were um, Korean Americans, Korean Canadians, uh, but they all came together uh, because of this sport they really truly loved and they were able to make history together because of this incredible sport that really nobody expected and anticipated, but because of timing, because of geopolitics and perhaps a little bit of chance, uh, they were able to uh, contribute toward uh, our understanding of what the power of the human spirit uh, the power of people-to-people -people contact, and the power of, uh, of sports diplomacy, and why it's so important that where politicians and diplomats fail, that common people uh, can succeed in connecting uh, communities that are traditionally don't sit in the same room together or share uh, together in a common meal for a common purpose. Uh, so we're really honored to uh, be here today to co-host uh, with, uh, with my friend Jenny and the Stimson Center. Uh, to celebrate this inaugural book of Seth Berkman, uh, and also uh, one of my biggest uh, media fans too, Steve Inski. Uh, we're so honored to have you as well. So yeah, so let's give a hand for both of them. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Jenny, uh, who will provide our second welcome. Great, thanks Abe, and thanks of course to the Council of Korean Americans for co-hosting today's uh, event. We at 38 North really appreciate the opportunities to collaborate on issues that transcend the U.S. national security discourse, and this is one of those unique moments. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jenny Town. I'm a fellow here at the Stimson Center and the co-founder and managing editor of 38 North. Um, I'm also a CICA member, um, so it's always a uh, fun to have the two worlds collide. And I'm also a Korean adoptee from Minnesota. So when Seth originally approached us to see if we'd be interested in hosting this book talk, how could I say no? <laughs> um, so just to set some context, um, I remember the first time the Olympics were held in Korea. Uh, it was Seoul, 1988. Um, the international headlines expressed awe over how South Korea's economy and society had developed since the devastation of the Korean War. It was unbelievable to many, the enormous transformation in just 35 years. Um, but as more and more reporters were there looking for unique stories to tell amid a sea of media coverage, um, the story of Korean overseas adoption seeped into that Olympic narrative. This business of international adoption basically started by the Koreans in the aftermath of the Korean War, 
was big business, sending increasing numbers of children overseas every year, generally to the US and Europe. Um, that year alone, uh, Korea had sent out over 8,000 children um, to the US and Europe. So jokingly, a narrative emerged that Korea's largest export was not its cars or its electronics, but its children. And what was supposed to be a moment of glory for South Korea, a coming out party of sorts on the international stage, um, became a moment of shame for the South Korean government, which then vowed to end overseas adoption by 1996. Well, 1996 came and went, um, but that commitment was never fulfilled. South Korea, even despite now having the lowest birth rate of OECD nations and becoming a rapidly aging society, still sends children overseas for adoption, um, although in greatly reduced numbers. 30 years after the Seoul Olympics, um, Korea hosted its first Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang in 2018. As Seth chronicles in his book, there was a sense of prestige that came with hosting a Winter Olympics, becoming world renowned in such winter sports as speed skating and figure skating. This time perhaps in anticipation of the questions that may arise about where Korea was on the issue of overseas adoption 30 years later, the South Korean government had recruited Toby Dawson, a Korean adoptee who won a bronze medal in snowboarding as part of the US team in the 2006 Winter Olympics to be on the South Korean Olympic bid and planning committees. I have to say, I was expecting uh, Korean adoption to be a big narrative during last year's Olympic coverage. Um, a 30 year retrospective of where Korea was in 88 and where they are now. And the South Korean government seemed to have anticipated that too, given how prominently Toby Dawson has played in Korea's Pyeongchang Olympics journey. Um, and as Seth highlights in the book, there was even uh, Marissa Brandt, a Korean adoptee hockey player who was recruited for the women's hockey team, whose adopted sister, Hannah, um, made it into the US Olympic hockey team as well, and whose stories were gaining publicity. But last year, instead of trying to pose distractions to the Olympics as they did in 88, the North Koreans instead stole the show. In many ways, the Pyeongchang Olympics marked the beginning of a new relationship between the international community and North Korea. And at the end of 2017, just months before the Olympics, the North had been testing high yield nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles, um, but started 2018 by accepting South Korea's invitation to participate in the Olympics. Talks about Olympic participation flowed seamlessly into talks about inter-Korean relations and the overall security situation, eventually leading to a summit um, between Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un and President Moon Jae-in, and eventually a first ever meeting between Kim and US President Donald Trump. No expense was spared in making the North Korean Olympic experience a positive one. High-level North Korean delegations attended the games, including Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jung. Um, the North Korean cheer squad was on hand to encourage their players along, and there was a series of cultural exhibitions that took place featuring musical performances from both North and South Korean bands, giving new meaning to the term K-pop. Taking it one step further, the two sides also agreed to march in together under a unification flag and have one unified team compete the women's hockey team. And while the idea had been floated beforehand, just weeks before North Korea tested its first ICBM in 2017, the fire and fury of the end of that year meant worsening relations between the two Koreas, making the prospects for it coming to fruition a distant thought. Um, but then, with only a few weeks left before the games, the women's hockey team was given the biggest challenge while being thrust into the political spotlight. The obstacles this team faced even before the North Korea factor of how to integrate players from the US, Canada, and South Korea, overcome language and cultural barriers, navigate the gender discrimination and social apathy for this traditionally unfeminine sport in order to create a competitive national hockey team were already huge. Um, but throw on top of that the weight of nationalist pride, political manipulation, and international scrutiny and the burden on this team's shoulders, some only teenagers, um, were enormous. So Seth skillfully captures the complexity of the situation in his new book, A Team of Their Own, weaving together the stories of the women in an intricate web of identity, nationalism, gender, politics, and of course, hockey. Um, and a side role, side supporting role for Minnesota. 
And while the situation today seems to be heading back to the old paradigm of confrontation with North Korea, it's good to reflect on where this process started and the sacrifices that were made um, to be able to explore where this diplomacy could lead. Um, so we're pleased to have with us today Seth Berkman to talk about his new book. Um, Seth has been a contributing reporter to the New York Times since 2012. His work often focuses on sports with a particular interest in examination of the perception of Asian athletes in the United States. Um, he was born in Seoul and raised in New Jersey, and he met the team while on assignment before the New York Times and made his first trip back to South Korea since his adoption during the PyeongChang Olympics. And with us as well, of course, is the ever popular and always insightful Steve Inskeep. And I have to tell you, you have a big fan base here at Stimson Center. <laughs> Um, Steve is, of course, host of NPR's Morning Edition, as well as NPR's Morning News podcast, Up First, along with Rachel Martin, David Green, and Noel King. And with that, um, we look forward to what should be a fascinating discussion, and I'll hand it over to Steve. Thank you. Thanks for both the introductions. Really appreciate them. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to talk with you. Congratulations uh, on the book. Um, <clears throat> the introductions there gave us a good picture of the geopolitical issues, the big questions that are on the table. What I appreciate about your approach here, of course, is that you go at these issues through the story of individuals, through the story of people. Um, and the first of a number of people I want to ask about, actually, is you, just so that people know. You briefly, at the beginning of the book, allude to your own story, your own connection to Korea. What is it? Yeah, so I was born in Seoul, 1982. I was adopted when I was only about three months old, and so I grew up in suburban New Jersey. It's a town called Lakewood. It's about halfway between New York and Philadelphia. And I have two sisters, one older, one younger, also adopted from Korea. Um, one thing that was kind of unique about where I grew up was there were maybe four or five other families that also had adopted children from Korea. Mm -hmm. So I knew of other Korean adoptees, but in no way did adoption kind of seem the norm to me. Um, just growing up, I never had any kind of real connection to Korea or any kind of real interest in Korea. I understood that I was Korean-American, but it wasn't necessarily something I wore proudly on my sleeve. Um, I didn't own a Korean flag and hung it up in my room or anything like that. And growing up, the one thing that I kind of remember is watching international sporting events like the Olympics or the World Cup or something. And if Korea was participating, I just kind of naturally would find myself rooting for them. And I've spoken to other uh, Korean Americans adoptees about this as well. There's one professional baseball player. His name is Rob Refsnyder. Mm -hmm. He played with the New York Yankees and the Blue Jays recently. And he's adopted from South Korea. And so sometimes I would just see him in the clubhouse and we would chat and sometimes occasionally talk about our backgrounds and I once asked him that question and it was the same thing for him. He never felt too attached to Korea growing up but if he saw a Korean athlete competing on TV he would become very patriotic almost in a way and just naturally kind of root for that person. Mm. And so that I guess you could say was kind of the extent of my connection. I even remember um, we never so much like my family would, went out for a Korean food but even if it was Chinese food or Asian cuisine, I didn't like it. Like, I just didn't like being in an atmosphere surrounded kind of by Asian culture. And I don't know exactly why I felt that way as a child. I think maybe part of it was just, oh, I'm being forced to kind of be Asian in this environment, sure. maybe. You're and, resenting the stereotypes. Right, in a way. right. And I mean, in, in terms of just encountering um, casual racism as a child, there were never instances that I think about now and deeply cut me or hurt me, but you know, there were times when people would pull their eyes back or just ask, do you know karate? The very basic rudimentary kind of things you hear as an Asian American growing up in this country. Um, so I don't think in terms of that aspect that ever pushed me away from being or feeling or kind of wanting to represent my Koreanness in any kind of way, but it definitely was missing for most of my childhood, most of my early adulthood, really, until I met players on this team. This is something that you end up writing about in the book, uh, because we'll just note, it's already been alluded to, there's a Korean diaspora, and some of the players for the South Korean national team were drawn from that diaspora. And 
uh, in encountering them, you found one who was adopted, is that right? Right. Tell me about her. Uh, Marissa Brandt, who's from Minnesota. And um, so Marissa has a really unique and interesting story. She was adopted from South Korea, and then a couple months after she was adopted, or I guess right when they were finishing her adoption paperwork and everything, her parents found out that the mother was pregnant. And so about six months after Marissa came here, um, her mother had another child. And growing up, Marissa and Hannah were always together, um, just the closest of sisters as you could kind of be. And Marissa originally took up figure skating. That's what she liked. Hannah more so was drawn to hockey. And since Marissa just always wanted to kind of be around her sister, she went to hockey full time. And then growing up in Minnesota where hockey is just basically part of the culture essentially, uh, they were both very good premier young hockey players. They played on prestigious travel teams. Everyone in kind of the Minnesota hockey community knew who Marissa and Hannah Brandt were. Um, as Marissa grew older and got to the high school level, she actually had a few concussions with which kind of set her back in a way. And Hannah just continued on this upward trajectory where she, um, by the time she graduated, she was named Miss Minnesota in terms of uh, girls hockey in the state. Every college program was offering her scholarships. And Marissa still played, she was still a good player, but the concussions just really set her back and almost made her tentative in a way on the ice. She was always afraid of having another hit to the head and that just maybe being the last time she would play. And in, in talking to Marissa early on, I remember one story she told me that stuck out was how you have all these colleges calling up their household and trying to get Hannah to come to their school. And some coaches would feign interest in Marissa to get Hannah. And once Marissa kind of found that out, you know, obviously she was heartbroken in yeah. a way. And so there was this kind of feeling of everyone began to know Marissa's Hannah's sister. And so Marissa, just in terms of her own individuality, was always, it's, it's hard to say, but you know, she was in Hannah's shadow in a way. Well, then how did she view the opportunity to play for South Korea when that came around? Right, so when that happened, she had just graduated from college, and so she thought she was done playing hockey, essentially, and just randomly kind of gets this offer. And her initial response, I was definitely intrigued. She was a bit kind of curious, is this a real thing happening? But kind of surprisingly to me, she was very gung-ho about the idea and just said, yeah, this is something I want to do. Because Marissa, growing up similar to me and what I think allowed us to have such a kind of, you know, interesting discussions where I, she felt very much the same way about adoption and being Korean as I did. And so just knowing that kind of her relationship to her birth country, if I had known her back then, I wouldn't have necessarily guessed her being so open to going back to Korea, but it was something where she thought, I'm getting this opportunity, why not, almost in a way, I think. And they get you, what, a Korean passport if you're going to be part right. of the national team? It wasn't like they were immediately handed a passport. They did have to go through a process and take a test and I even think recite the national anthem. So they did have to go through the proper steps. I think some aspects were maybe accelerated on the timeline where they mm -hmm. didn't have to wait as much. Uh, the government knowing they're going to possibly be playing in the Olympics. So. Yeah, they had to hurry up and get to practice. Right, so they right. Don't make them <laughs> take a big citizenship test. Um, so she then gets an opportunity to join, uh, as some other Americans do, uh, Korean Americans, this South Korean national team. Now, when I try to think of powerhouse hockey countries, yeah. Is, is South Korea one of those countries? No, South Korea is like the Washington football team of, <laughs> <laughs> of hockey. Um, South Korea had never made an Olympics before. Uh, the stats, even right now, I think there are about 200 registered female hockey players in South Korea. Uh, so they would be going up against countries on average whose players were three, four inches taller, 20, 30 pounds heavier, but also had been playing since they were two, three years old. So any Minnesota town with a thousand people probably had more Definitely. women playing hockey than, okay. For sure, yeah. 200 in the entire country. The entire country. You yeah. highlight one of them, Sojung, am I saying her name correctly? Yes. Um, who started uh, playing somehow at a very, at a ridiculously early age. Seven years old, is that right? Seven years old, and by the time she was nine, she was already skating with the women's national team. So that shows... On because the, nobody else was available? Because no one else was available, but also how good of a player Sojung was. Um, 
there are pictures of her standing in net, and she's maybe four feet tall. She, the crossbar of the goal is way above her head, so you wonder, oh, just shoot it over her, and it'll go in kind of in a way. But yeah, So Jung started skating with the national team when she was nine. I think she officially started playing with them maybe when she was 11 or 12. But she, by the time the Olympics came around, she had been on the national team for 18 years at that point. And when So Jung was playing, the team was so bad. Uh, they would play Japan and lose 29 to nothing. The shots on goal would be 107 to 1. And So Jung, being 12 years old, standing in goal, being battered with hockey pucks, she told me after every game she would have to get pain relieving injections just from all the pucks bouncing off her body. And so she did this for decades before kind of she got to a point where the team around her was finally good enough kind of in a way to sustain the pressure. I just want to note, 29 to nothing sounds really bad, but you make it sound even worse by noting that there has never been an NHL game in history that's been that lopsided. The either. highest scoring uh, blowout in the NHL was 14 to nothing, so. So 29 nothing is not good. Not good. Um, <laughs> which then led to my next question. How would anybody spot her as a talent on a team that is so terrible when so many goals are being scored around her? I think they could people immediately could see just a natural kind of, they knew that when you're watching South Korea play at that point, the puck's <coughs> never gonna leave the zone. So it, along with facing 100 shots, she did make 75 or 80 saves per game. Hmm. And just um, in watching So Jung over the years, her reflexes, um, no one could seem to beat her one-on-one. -on -one. But one of the problems with the Korean team was since their systems were still very elementary kind of in a way, uh, a cheap deflection or you know a player making a turnover that would often lead to a goal. But you know if So Jung was there, you could have the top American Canadian player coming at her on a breakaway, and So Jung would probably stop the shot. Hmm. But you know if a Korean player was out of position, standing in front of the net of her, puck would hit off her skate, and So Jung it would just be a deflection or something like that, and that's how goal, a lot of the goals happened. So she could play, and that was clear to the people who knew what to, right. what to look for. So uh, 2018 was approaching, which also means we're approaching the period when you were meeting these players and beginning to interview them. Uh, what was the opportunity that presented itself for 2018 for the South Korean team? So in 2011, South Korea was awarded the 28 Winter Olympics. And even back then, uh, Korean government officials, Korean Olympic Committee knew they were celebrating, but also knew we have to create a hockey team now. Um, hockey is very much a centerpiece event of the Winter Olympics. And so they went, eventually what they did was they went in search of Korean Americans or Korean Canadians that maybe would be interested and they could get citizenship to play on the team. How they went about it was the Korea Ice Hockey Association, which is the governing body for ice hockey in Korea, similar to USA Hockey here. One of their um, media communications people just basically went online and Googled every American or Canadian college women's hockey team and scan the rosters. And if he saw a name that sounded Korean, hmm. if they had pictures on the roster and they look Korean, he emailed them. So it was this really rare instance of racial profiling kind of being <laughs> beneficial in a way. He told me that the first people he reached out to were like a Yang and a Wu and they were Chinese. And so he, <laughs> he thought he wasn't gonna find anybody, but eventually he did stumble upon a few. And that's how the is this how Marissa, the woman we were talking about earlier, got her solicitation, so mm, to speak? Not Marissa. The way Marissa kind of got found out was a woman who was, Rebecca Baker, who was, eventually became an assistant coach on the Korean national team. Her husband was a goaltender coach. And so it was the summertime in Minnesota. The University of Minnesota is having a hockey camp, and Rebecca's husband is helping out. And so Hannah Brandt attended the University of Minnesota. So she's there at the time. Coach of the Minnesota team, Brad Frost, he knows Marissa. She goes to Hannah's games whenever she can. So she knows about Marissa. And so Rebecca's husband is talking to Coach Frost one day and just kind of mentioning, yeah, Rebecca started volunteering with the South Korean national women's hockey team. Um, they're, they're really young, they're really raw, and they're actually still kind of looking for players. And I guess the light bulb just goes off in Coach Frost's head. I know Marissa. Hmm. And so Marissa's information gets passed to Becca. Becca ends up calling Marissa and kind of 
laying out the option, and within two weeks, she's in South Korea. That's great. Yeah. So six Americans go to join this team. Um, I believe you said they called uh, not foreigners, but... Imports. Imports. Yeah. What was it like when the imports met the homegrown South Koreans? Is that the way right. I should describe them? So Domestic? Just domestic be, product? Whatever. Just because of the name imports. So I always wondered why they called them that. And I asked the South Korean players eventually. There's no great story behind it, unfortunately. They said it just sounds better than saying foreigners. So they called them the imports. And the first two imports to go over were Danelle Im and Caroline Park, who were both from Toronto. Danelle was kind of the first person to respond and say yes to this offer. And after she says yes, uh, a member from the Korean Ice Hockey Association asked her, do you by chance happen to know any other Korean hockey players? And it just so happened that a few years earlier, Danelle's dad is walking the family dog in their neighborhood out in North York, a suburb of Toronto, and he spots a woman, a Korean woman, wearing an ice hockey jacket. So immediately he goes over and introduces himself and says hello and says, where'd you get that ice hockey jacket? And the woman tells him that her daughter plays ice hockey at Princeton University. They lived on the same street about three minutes apart, mm. never ran into each other before that day. And so when they asked Car uh, Danelle, Danelle says, yeah, actually there's this girl that lives down the street from me that is Korean and plays hockey. And that's how Caroline got invited. Um, this is so random, this entire <laughs> Caroline had a real interesting background herself. She was a child actress, so mm -hmm. she was on the show Degrassi in Canada <laughs> and did um, a lot of commercials for Nike Robitussin. But once she went to Princeton, she focused on that and kind of quit acting. So they went over to South Korea. They were kind of the first two, the test cases, I guess you could say. And at first, um, the South Korean nationals were a bit chilly towards them. They didn't like this idea of new people coming over and maybe taking their spots. At that point, they know they're going to the Olympics, and so that's what they're focused on. And maybe these, they assume what are better players coming in. Maybe some people will be sacrificed in the process. So the first, one of the first days they're there, Caroline and Danelle are taken to the locker room at Terring, which is the national training facility for all Olympic athletes, basically like Colorado Springs here in the U.S. And they're taken into the locker room and. A lot of the girls are just kind of mumbling or talking, and they're speaking in Korean, thinking that they don't know. Danelle doesn't speak Korean, but Caroline did grow up um, kind of fluent in Korean, and she can hear them saying things, and they're not the nicest of things being said about her. So eventually, Caroline kind of pipes up and says, I kind of understand what you're saying. I don't really appreciate it. And so they were a bit taken aback by that, but I think immediately became a bit more respectful. It took a little bit of time, but over time, the South Koreans saw, yes, they did. Ha they saw how good these imports were, but they also began to realize, OK, they can really help us out, and we need this help. And so it became very, uh, within you know, a few weeks, I would say, it became a much more kind of comfortable situation with more of a synthesis. So that was the first synthesis that was required of them, was South Koreans mixing with the imports, quote right. unquote, but a much more dramatic uh, mixing was to come. Right. How uh, did it come about that the North Korean team would be merged with the South Korean team? Where did that idea come from? So officially it happened on New Year's Day, January 2018, when Kim Jong-un goes on North Korean state television and says, surprising the world basically, it would be great if North Korean athletes could participate in the upcoming Olympic Games. Um, it took a few weeks of neg actual negotiations to make that happen, but that kind of set everyone on the South Korean side in a frenzy because they were so focused on not only had they tried to get North Korea to participate months, years before, but I think there was some worry of what will North Korea, will they act out during the Olympics? Because before the 1988 Games, um, I think about eight, nine months before, North Koreans hijacked a plane and killed everybody on board. During the 2002 World Cup that South Korea co-hosted with Japan, the day before the final, there was a skirmish between North Korean and South Korean 
uh, sailors were soldiers were killed on both sides. So I think there was kind of this fear of will something like that happen again? And South Korea was so eager to make sure not only would something happen, but also to have North Koreans and work on improving this relationship that they saw breaking down not only between North Korea and South Korea, but in the U.S. had become involved the year before as well with the back and forth between the two leaders of North Korea and South Korea. So those kind of tensions and fears. Actually, though, if we go back to the summer of 2017, that's when the idea of a unified team was first floated around. There was a new minister of sports and culture who came on, Minister Do, and just kind of matter of fact, randomly, you're talking to a South Korean journalist, he mentioned just out of the blue, this idea, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could have a unified hockey team at the Olympics? And at the time in South Korea, it was big news, and people thought, oh, is this going to happen? And the players on the team got really nervous and were really upset about this. They had never heard anything like this thrown about. And it was all kind of this idea of, in some way, we can get North Korea involved in the games and, and take these baby steps towards some kind of closer relationship. I'm thinking about the geopolitical situation at that time. This is when President Trump was new in office, was trading uh, less than fully diplomatic remarks with Kim Jong-un, and uh, there were threats going back and forth. There was a fear of an actual war. Yeah. There must have been extra pressure to do some kind of gesture of peace, like unifying these teams, which is a long way of asking, can President Trump, therefore, take credit for <laughs> the unification of the two Korean women's hockey teams? I don't think he can. I don't think we should <laughs> give him those kind of kudos. Um, but as you mentioned, not only were governments kind of pushing this, but in the summer of 2017, the president of the IOC, Thomas Bach, uh, he came out and supported the idea. President Moon went out and said, I support Minister Doe's idea. That would be something great to happen. So you had these very powerful people kind of pushing this idea. And then on the other side, you had the women's hockey team who were like, no, we don't want this to happen. The women's hockey team point of view did not prevail. No, it did not. Can you describe the first moment when the North Korean women met the South Korean women? Yes, yeah, so they go to, by that time, South Korea had opened up a new national training facility, which was in Jinchon, so they're no longer tearing. And so the South Korean players are kind of forced to wait outside with bouquets of flowers. The North Koreans are coming in on buses. And uh, on watching South Korean news feeds of that day, they were helicopters in the sky kind of trailing the North Korean buses as they crossed the border. It was like watching O.J. Simpson being chased around his Bronco. Just from above, you're watching mm. and the progress. and. Tons of journalists were there waiting. And so the South Korean players are kind of outside, shivering in the cold, just wanting to get this over with. Um, one player told me that they knew that this was basically a staged event. It was just there for a photo opportunity. That's why they had the flowers and everything. And they just wanted to go inside and actually practice. Like, if this is going to happen, let's try to make this work as much as we can on the ice. Uh, so the, South, the North Korean uh, convoy arrives, and they step off their bus. And when they first step off, I've seen pictures and videos, and it almost looks like West Side Story or something, where you have these two sides about to just maybe clash. Yeah. But um, one of the players, it was actually So Jung, she was the first one to kind of step forward with her flowers and hand them over. So you have this exchange of the flowers to the North Koreans, and they get together and have their picture taken, and then eventually go inside. And But the South Koreans are not happy at this point. If we kind of just go back maybe a week or two, um, the team was in Minnesota for a training camp in early January 2018, and I was following them around at the time. They would come to Minnesota for these training camps every few months just because there was no one else to play against in South Korea. There were no women's teams, so they would come and play American colleges, and that's how they would get training and exhibition games in. So rumors were going around at the time that Kim Jong-un's speech had happened. The team was worried in a way, but they were so focused on the Olympics too in training that it didn't consume them. Um, I had lunch with the coach the day before the team went back, and she had said that, you know, if this happens, Kia, of the Korean Ice Hockey Association had told me they'll let me know in advance, and she hadn't heard anything at that point, so they don't think it's happening. So the team flies back to Seoul, 
um, middle of January, and when they land at the airport, they're at the baggage claim, and they turn on their phones, and that's when the messages and the news kind of comes in that as they were in the air, the South Korean government and North Korea agreed to make this unified team. Mm. And then they had this West Side Story moment and right. had to get to know each other. Uh, I have to, I think at this moment, ask a question about your journalistic technique because it becomes the story of the North Korean team and the South Korean team. Uh, were you allowed any access to the North Korean players? No, and so that was something I was thinking about constantly. One other kind of roadblock was when, when you cover the Olympics, you have to apply for credentials like two, two and a half years before the actual games. So this idea of writing a book had only happened for me about a year before. So it was too late to actually get a credential. So I bought tickets to all the games. And that was hard because all the tickets were sold out. So I was going on websites like secondary markets on South, in South Korea trying to find tickets. I don't read Korean or understand Korean, so it's all through Google Translate. Um, so going on like the South Korean equivalent. Did you buy Taylor Swift tickets or something? No, I did mistake? not. They, okay. they all kind of worked out. But access, going there thinking, and I remember I arrived in Seoul on February 1st, so about 10 days before the Olympics. And this was my first trip back to South Korea since I had been adopted. And I remember talking to other adoptees or other Koreans, and they had mentioned, you know, when they went back for the first time, it was this moment, you know, almost like an epiphany, like I'm back in South Korea. I didn't have that. I was so kind of focused on how am I going to report this out that that was all consuming in a way. And so, in terms of access to the North Koreans, they were followed so closely by not only South Korean Olympic officials, but you had North Korean government officials. Even if at one point there were North Korean spies who found their way into their party. That kind of story is interesting. Basically, there was a list of who was in the North Korean party, and then there were these two extra men wearing like North Korean Olympic gear. And then eventually the South Korean... Who did not Korean appear to be members of a women's hockey or team. Or coaches or anything. Yeah. And South Korean officials were kind of like, wait, who are those two people that aren't on the list? And eventually they just kind of vanish from the party. Um, but the, I remember talking to the South Koreans about them, and they, they knew something was up. They didn't seem to be you know, part of the party or anything, and they noticed, they thought they were North Korean because they were much taller than South Koreans, they said, but also the accent that they spoke with was so refined kind of in a way mm. that they thought it wasn't real, that they were North Korean spies or government folks or what have you. Um, I think I can guess the answers, but why were the North Koreans so closely watched? Yeah, one, so one kind of story that I think exemplifies this is a South Korean player on the team, Ko Hae-in. She told me this anecdote about how she eventually developed a sixth sense of when she knew a North Korean player was going to enter the vicinity. If she was in a room and watching TV, someone would kind of rush in and shut off the TV and then the North Koreans would come in. So they didn't want them consuming any kind of information or anything that wasn't North Korea state sanctioned. So even the very early conversations that the two sides had, the South Korean players told me and the imports that they seemed very canned and rehearsed, almost like they were being fed propaganda answers from the North Koreans. They would often kind of close their sentences by saying, oh yes, all thanks to the great leader. There was one time they were sitting at lunch, one of the first days, and for some reason the North Koreans brought up the topic of ice cream. This was the kind of riveting conversations that they started out with. And a North Korean player says, oh yes, in Pyongyang we have ice cream shops with three different flavors. And one of the imports, Randy Griffin, says, man, if we ever take her to Baskin Robbins, she's going to defect right away. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, it... I, I think you're hinting it was uh, a fear of defection, but also a fear of information contamination. Information, and one of the one of my favorite kind of stories to emerge from the two teams being together is Marissa Brandt. She um, she's such a kind-hearted person, and so she immediately she wanted to be very giving and warm towards the North Koreans because she remembered when she first came on the team how hard it was for her and not knowing if she was going to be accepted and for the most part the South Koreans were very welcoming so she wanted to be the same way and she eventually became friends I guess you could say with this one player um, Unjung 
and every morning she would run down and give Marissa a hug, and then at some point in the day they could be on their stationary bikes or just kind of hanging out for a few minutes, and Unjong would ask to see Marissa's phone. She would say this in Korean, Marissa doesn't speak Korean, but she would just kind of signal, can I see your phone? And so Marissa would give her her phone, and every time Marissa, uh, Unjong would then kind of signal to her that she would want to see her album photos, or her, her photo albums. And she, Marissa would open it up for her, and then Unjong would always go to the same pictures. And they were pictures of basically just Marissa with her friends or her family. Mm. And she would see Unjong just kind of in a trance, staring at these photos. And Marissa always thought she's just kind of wondering or thinking, what would that be like to her? And so that would be an everyday thing that Unjong would do, just have these few moments, minutes, kind of seeing what Marissa's life was like. Did you feel, as a writer, uh, not talking to the North Koreans, but seeing them play, seeing, being there around them, and hearing stories through the South Koreans and the imports, did you feel that you got any particular insight into what their lives were like in North Korea? A little bit. Uh, one person I actually interviewed for the book, his name is Scott Howe, and he works for an NGO that for a couple years already has done these annual trips to North Korea based around hockey. It's kind of a goodwill thing that they do. To, it's actually called the Friendship League, I believe. So every year, people would sign up and a bunch of Canadians would go to North Korea and play in these games with North Korean players and occasionally they would play with the women's team as well. And so he was a good insight in terms of information of what their lives were like, what kind of equipment they used, what their facilities were. And so very much like in South Korea, um, women's hockey no longer was seen as a favorite sport. They, had, they would train at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. at night, so they had very bad kind of training times, training slots. Um, but also, the players often came from the north, um, the northern end of North Korea, and then if they were selected for the national team, they moved to Pyongyang, and they were given a better quality of life, kind of in a way. So they were provided housing, sometimes even an automobile. So it was looked upon as a very prestigious kind of um, event if a daughter was chosen for the women's national hockey team. So the South Koreans were in a richer country, but they were, this is overstating it, but they were kind of nobodies, whereas the North Koreans were given somewhat elite status in a very poor country. Right, and then there was also this long-standing rumor, I guess you could call it, but all the South Korean players swore by it, and they all told me the story. They said that at one point, North Korea was a very strong hockey country, at least in Asia. Um, every four years or so, there's the Asian Winter Games, which on the continent are almost as high in prestige as the Olympics. And so South North Korea would often come in second or third place. They were a really good team, and they always beat South Korea as well. And the South Korean players told me the story that the reason, one of the reasons why North Korea once was so good at hockey was because Kim Jong-il liked hockey. So he would fund them with... Kim Jong-un's father. Kim Jong-un's father. Yeah. It was just one kind of his eccentric tastes, like drinking Hennessy and <laughs> what he did that he liked with hockey. Kidnapping movie stars. Right, right. Hockey. And, yeah. um, and so he would fund them, and they had proper, more proper training at the time. And when he passed away, um, the interest in women's hockey in North Korea. So how did the North Northerners and Southerners and the imports blend as a team? In terms of their actual performance on the ice, the South Koreans knew this and you could kind of see it right away. The North Koreans were not on the same skill level. Um, they even to kind of detrimentally brought down the level of the team. One of the things that made the merger of the unified team so difficult was the IOC said that it wasn't just two or three players that they were gonna be adding to this team. They made a special mandate to add 12 North Koreans. And within that, you, the IOC demanded that at least three North Koreans had to dress every game. So you had at least three North Koreans playing who had two weeks essentially to learn all the systems, the playbook of the South Korean team, and they were already less skilled players. One of the biggest kind of hurdles that the team had to overcome was very quickly the South Koreans learned that the North Koreans didn't speak the same language as them. And what I mean by that is, they didn't use the same terms for hockey as the South Koreans. The South Koreans use some South Korean terms, but a lot of English terms for hockey as well. So if a North Korean player was on the ice and wanted to pass, instead of saying, pass me the puck, they would say, contact me. 
And the South Korean player hearing this had no idea what she meant when she said, contact me. And so they basically created a makeshift dictionary that had the North Korean term, the South Korean term, and then the English term as well. So every, hmm. uh, everyone on the team could maybe kind of understand what just they were going to say on the ice to each other. What were the scores like when they got on the ice? The f first two games, they played Switzerland and Sweden, and they, uh, the unified Korean team lost both games eight to nothing. Um, the first, but not 29 to nothing, not so this is actually this is progress. And even going into those games, I mean, in the Olympics before, Switzerland was the bronze medalist. Sweden traditionally has won bronze or silver in the Olympic Games, so you were facing these two European powerhouses. And the Koreans knew entering those games they probably weren't going to win, but they were hoping to keep it to maybe a three-goal differential. They even thought if we lose 3 nothing, 4-1, to one, it'll show that we're a respectable team. We can maybe compete on the same level as teams like this. But the two 8-0 losses were devastating to the team. Um, a, a, after the Sweden game that they lost 8 nothing, players had told me that they were just resentful that the North Koreans had come on, that they felt like any opportunity we had of winning a game or even showing you know, that we were a serious team were taken away. What happened after that? So the third game they played was against Japan, which the Koreans had always kind of circled as the game that they might win. Japan was a better team, but in terms of just size, physicality, similar stature, and also both teams were very much built around speed. So they were the team that Korea matched up the best against. And then you also had just the centuries of feelings towards Japan. When a Korea-Japan game happens, it's very much ramped up in intensity, just given the historical um, bitterness between the two sides. And one of the things that happened right before the game, the team is in the locker room. And the, South, the North Koreans had one coach who kind of came along with them. His name was Pak Cholho. And he never really seemed to say much of anything. He was just happy to be there, kind of in the background, it seemed. Um, but minutes before the game against Japan, he stands up and gives this impassioned speech where he's basically kind of cursing the Japanese. And all the players in the locker room are like, wait, what? And, <laughs> and so it does kind of inspire them in a way, but they also think it's funny, and it loosens them up a bit. And so there, there is this feeling going into the Japan game that they can win. Um, eventually, Japan goes up 2 nothing. It's in the second period, and it just kind of seems, being in the arena, uh-oh, we're headed for another really lopsided game. Um, but then, middle, second period, uh, Korea scored their first goal. It was Marissa Brandt had the assist to Randy Griffin, another import player, who scored the goal. And what I always thought was interesting about those two being involved in the play was they had talked to me for months about they were the ones who I felt were most unsure about their identity and being on this team throughout this journey. And so they're the ones that kind of were etched into Korean lore as being responsible for Korea's first Olympic hockey goal. Hmm. What was the final score of the game? Uh, four to one. Okay. Yeah. So that was actually the scale of defeat that they thought would be a respectable Right, defeat. right. And for after they scored the game, I mean, you had Cor most of the fans in the game, aside from the North Korean cheerleaders being there, I'd say 90% of the Koreans in attendance had never seen a hockey game before. I remember seeing on Naver, uh, like a month before the games, they basically had a, a guide teaching Koreans what hockey was, in terms of power of play or things like that. And so you would see things happen where if Korea just had the puck and passed to another player successfully, people in the crowd would ooh and ah and cheer for that. And so when they actually scored a goal, I mean, people standing up screaming at the top of their lungs. I saw you know, adults crying when that happened. And for the next 20 minutes of action or so, it was a 2-1 game, and Korea had other opportunities to score, so they were in it. And then a late penalty gave put Japan on the power play, and that's how they scored their third goal. And they, then they added an empty net goal at the end to make it 4-1. Uh, I have a couple more questions, and uh, if I remember the instructions from Jenny, I'm going to invite some questions from the audience. Is that right? There's got to be a lot of expertise in this room, and we can learn from you. Uh, and uh, then there's going to be an opportunity to have some books signed, right? So you're going to sell some books today, so this right. is a plus. Uh, but a couple of questions first. And one comes off of a thing that you said earlier. You noted that the South Korean players were aware at the moment of meeting that they were part of a propaganda event. 
it doesn't seem unreasonable for them to conclude that the entire exercise was a propaganda event, that it may have seemed necessary for geopolitics and the larger kind of issues that we spoke about at the beginning, but on a personal level, they were just being used. Uh, having gone through that experience, did the players tell you they thought it was worth it? Those feelings, I think, evolved over time. At the beginning, no one was really in favor, it, favor of it. And players had even told me, which I think a lot of the young Koreans shared a sentiment of, was, was they don't see unification as necessary. Um, they didn't grow up with this of knowing friends or family from North Korea like parents and an older generation did. They've grown up knowing North Korea as basically just this antagonist who they're always giving aid to and things like that. And so there, was this, there wasn't this attachment for a lot of the players. And being involved very early, none of them were in favor. And they knew the politics of it and how many things just seemed so staged. In the first game, you have uh, Moon Jae in there and Kim Yo Jong, Kim Jong Un's sister is there and all these high government officials and the North Korean cheerleaders are there and so it's this big pageant going on in the stands and no one's focusing on the team and they got very upset about that. I remember talking to Shin So Jung, the goaltender, and the moment she had always kind of dreamed of was hearing her name announced in the Olympics. And when that moment came, they're announcing the starting lineups. They're about to call So Jung's name, and that's when President Moon walks in. So immediately, everyone's attention just turns to him and Kim Yo Jung walking in, and all the photographers and journalists rush over. And so over the loudspeaker, you hear So Jung's name, but no one's paying attention to that moment. Um, the players during the games. That's the moment when you inadvertently flip a puck over the glass, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> no, go on, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, during the games, you had the, I go back to the North Korean cheerleaders, but they were doing these uh, choreographed routines that you just couldn't kind of take your eyes off in a way. And even the players too, they're, you know, in a break in action, they're just staring up at, you know, a hundred North Korean women wearing matching red track suits and, you know, waving unification flags and singing songs about cheer up and let's go and they're losing seven to nothing. And there's this feeling of just, hey, we're playing a hockey game here. This is what we're here for while everything else is going on. But then in talking to players more so kind of after the games, I would ask players when I met up with them um, in the summer of 2018, a couple months after the Olympics, and just asking, what do you think when you see you know, Donald Trump shaking hands with Kim Jong-un and, you know, these talks about not only reproachment but unification possibly happening. And, and no one, I think, felt responsible. They didn't want to take credit for it in any kind of way. But I think some of them started to feel maybe we were a part of a moment that is special um, and does mean something to people, even if maybe it doesn't mean that to us on a certain level. I think uh, it's appropriate to ask, if you don't mind, can I get you to turn to page 312? Sure. And it's the end of a chapter, uh, one of the last chapters, or the last chapter. And I wonder if I can get you to read the last two paragraphs below the photograph there. Sure. So this is basically the day that the North Koreans and South Koreans say goodbye to each other. Um, as the North Koreans made their way outside, 24-year-old Ford Ryo Swang Hui stood at the door shaking hands with Han Do Hee, who was born in the same year, sniffling to try to hold in her emotion as best she could. When Song Hui stepped on board the bus that was to take her back across the 38th parallel, she grabbed Do Hee's hand and held tightly. Slowly, the grasp loosened from five fingers to four, to three, to two, before North Korean officials finally closed the bus door and separated them. Not ready to say goodbye, with one final gasp, Sung Hui ran to a window and lifted it open to touch the hands of her South Korean teammates one more time, trying to contain her urge to run off the bus to stay behind with them. Similarly, the South Korean players' hands reached out and held tightly, as if they were trying to pull Sung Hui and others back off the bus. Dohee put her hand through the window opening to Dohi put her hand through the window opening to gently wipe away Song Hui's tears while Susie Jo cho chose to sto stand farther back, feelings, feeling as if she would be unable to man maintain her composure if she got too close. When the bus finally pulled away, 
The rest, of, the rest of the bus's windows were slung open, and the North Korean players waved farewell one last time, craning their necks as far back as they could to get one more glimpse of the South Korean players. Long after the white and maroon bus finally pulled away out of view, Dohi stood alone, waving northward, hoping it might turn around. Mm. That's great. Well done. That will be a scene when you get the movie going, the, <laughs> the Netflix special of this. They will probably include, it's beautifully, beautifully written. Thank you. Uh, I do want to invite some of your questions. How much time do we have, do you think, for questions? Like? Oh, a half hour, because goodness, okay. Uh, so I guess what I'd like people to do, if you don't mind, is uh, say your name. And you raised your hand there, ma'am, so I'm going to let you go first and just say something about yourself. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just visiting. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Douglas, and I'm just uh, visiting from, uh, I'm a, a postdoctoral fellow at um, the Korea Institute at Harvard. Um, and I had a question. You were talking a lot about um, sort of the, uh, propagandistic uh, staging of the event. And I, I think that became really apparent coming on the heels of the 2016 games in Rio, in which there was this kind of um, selfie image of the North and South Korean gymnasts um, who right. had taken it. And we're right here on the screen right now, we're seeing a kind of, seems like almost a reenactment of that photo, uh, which in contrast to the 2018 kind of staging of it, that seemed much more, um, say, candid or genuine, which probably, um, uh, you know, was behind the reason it became so popular and circulated. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how, was there, say, a desire on part of the South Korean or North Korean state to kind of uh, at least give that Im same impression, uh, even knowing that it was a kind of po propaganda staging? Right. Um, so the one photo that you posted of the two players in the hockey jerseys, that's actually um, a selfie taken on a movie set. In 2016, there was a movie that came out in South Korea. It was called, it had two names. It was called Takeoff and also Runoff 2. The reason it was called Runoff 2 was it was technically a sequel to a movie about ski jumping, but had nothing to do with <laughs> ski jumping. Just kind of in translation, it was called Runoff 2, but it's also called Takeoff. And so one of the South Korean players, Suzy Jo, she was an extra basically in the movie. So she portrayed a North Korean player in the movie. And so that photo is with a South Korean actress playing one of the South Korean hockey players. And the story behind that movie, it more so focuses on a, a lot of it is fictional, but it focuses on a uh, South Korean hockey team from about 2004 or so, when they first played, um, made one of their first appearances in the Asian Winter Games. And the story of, the, of that film is there's a South Korean player who defected from North Korea, and her sister plays on the North Korean team, so it's this big drama of when they see each other on the ice again. But in terms of your question, there were moments like that. There was uh, one kind of story that made a lot of international news waves, at least in Korea, it was this very big story in this image of uh, one of the first days together when the team is still at Jincheon at the training facility, uh, two of the North Korean players had birthdays. So there's this photo of them surrounded by birthday cake and blowing out the candles, surrounded by South Korean players singing them happy birthday. The South, later I found out that the players didn't know it was their birthdays. They were informed of it, and so they were basically kind of told, it's these two players' birthdays, we're, let's sing them happy birthday so they could take a photo. But it was a photo like the IOC put out, the IIHF, which is the International Ice Hockey Federation, so that was something. And even in the book, I mentioned a quote from Thomas Bach, who's the president of the IOC, and speaking about that photo, he's like, basically he says, yes, this is the Olympic spirit. What you see here, this is what the Olympic Games are about. And so that was something that they could piggyback off of to show we're right in doing this. This is the message that we like to portray. Thanks, Douglas. Uh, who else has a question here? It's a very quiet crowd. Right over there. Please, go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm Rachel, a former downhill ski racer, and I actually raced with... Um, uh, University of Colorado at Boulder, or I was on the team to race, they have three different levels, A, B, and C, A being the highest level, like the most expert, you know, fastest racers, and back then, because I'm old, um, we had, uh, they were, most of the people on the A team were from 
Norway, Switzerland, Italy, France, and they were also called imports, and I don't know how they felt about that. Just before I had to leave the team. Just before you ask your question, were you also in a movie that was a sequel about an unrelated <laughs> sport? <laughs> No, no okay, but on. I did race with the pack rats in my 30s, which is the Pacific Area Recreational Alpine Teams. Okay. Um, I mean, Pacific Area Conference Recreational Alpine Teams. Um, so my, my question uh, is, is relating to the upcoming uh, Winter Olympics um, in Japan. And, and if you think that there may be any hope for a, a united uh, women's team again from between North and South Korea for hockey and then uh, just just it's not it's not exactly the the same thing but I think there may have been a little bit of tokenization as well with team refugee in Rio uh, uh -huh. several years ago during the Summer Olympics as well and if you have any con concept of how to um, avoid that and really focus on the peaceful efforts that, that international sports and teams and playing together and against one another can bring. Thanks. Right. Um, yeah, so the next Summer Olympics are in Tokyo 2020. The next Winter Olympics are 2022 in China. Um, but in terms of an actual unified hockey team taking place there, it would be kind of hard, but the hardest reason would be is Korea would have to qualify. The reason they played in 2018 was because they were the host country, so they were given an automatic berth. And so they would have to qualify this time. The top 10 teams, I think they're going to have 10 teams in the next tournament. Right now in the world, Korea is ranked about 16. So they're about a level below the top teams that are expected to qualify. Um, so, But if it doesn't happen in hockey, I think there's a strong chance you will see it happen in other sports. There's been a lot more this kind of idea of creating unified Korean teams on the peninsula since the hockey team. In the Asian Summer Games in 2018, there were, I believe, three unified teams, one being women's basketball that competed. And I know there is a plan for 2020 to have some kind of unified Korean team in some sport. And the two countries' um, Olympic committees are discussing right now about joining a bid to try and host the 2032 Olympics together. So I think as, as long as kind of relations are okay between the two in terms of sport and the sport diplomacy, I think you will see the two Koreas continue to try to build these unified teams in different events. Thanks. Somebody over here? Yeah, go right ahead. Man. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rachel Stalton, the managing director here at Stimson, so thank you both for being here. Um, I think you've made a very good case for how this um, team has transcended sort of the politics that were behind its formation in that last two paragraphs that you read I thought were quite moving in terms of clearly relationships were, were built. And I haven't read the end, so I'm sort of asking you to ruin the story before I've read the book. Um, but did those relationships last? Like have they maybe made the North and South players haven't been able to stay in contact, but did the imports, have they stayed in contact with the South Korean players? Is there any communication between the North and South players? In, in terms of North and South, there isn't. They haven't spoken to each other since the Olympics. One thing that did happen, um, I have a colleague, a friend who's a broadcast journalist, one of the TV stations in South Korea. And so every year the IAHF has world championship tournaments. Um, but it depends on kind of what level you are, what group you're put in. So South Korea is a level ahead of North Korea. So they didn't play in the same tournament in 2018. But m my colleague who's a journalist, she went to the tournament that North Korea was playing in. And before she went, she had the South Koreans kind of video record messages. And so when she saw them, she played them for them. Um, in, I'll, I'll answer your question about the imports in a second, kind of their relationship with the South Koreans. But that, that was something that became very prevalent in all the players' minds as they knew this end date was going to happen. And one thing, one story that I like is Marissa Brandt, one of the imports, another with Unjung, the player she'd become very close with. Uh, the day before they leave, she gives her this bracelet that she had always wore for games. It was something her mother had given her. It was essentially like a good luck charm. And so she gave it to Eun Jung, and she was like, I hope you can remember me by this. And Marissa didn't even know if Eun Jung was able to kind of keep it once she got back to North Korea. But, you know, there, there was this feeling of at least kind of remember me. A lot of the South Korean players wrote notes just saying things like that, please don't ever forget me. And when they said goodbye, a lot of the North Korean players would say, 
niceties such as, oh yes, come to Pyongyang anytime, we'll eat cold noodles together. And the South Koreans actually got kind of mad in a way because they had to lie to them because they basically had to say, oh yes, I'll come if I can, but they knew that that's not going to happen. Um, the imports do still keep in contact with the South Korean players. One of the South Korean national players, Park Yeun, she now attends Ryerson University and plays hockey there in Toronto. And Nell Im, an import, attends Ryerson as well. And so they live next door to each other, basically. And then this weekend, Brandy Griffin, another import player, she's getting married. And so Danelle Yeun and another player, uh, Lee Minji, who moved to Toronto shortly after, they're driving down to go to her wedding. So there are still those kind of relationships. Just a technical question here. If a South Korean player wanted to get in touch with a North Korean player, is that literally impossible? Or is there some channel that I don't know about where that would be? From all I've heard, it's, it's literally impossible. One story, um, Marissa Brandt, who had grown very close to some of the North Korean players, she's talking to her dad like the day before the North Koreans go back. And she's like, Dad, I have my South Korean citizenship. I think I could get into North Korea. And her dad is just like freaking out. He's like, Marissa, I don't think you can. I don't think you should try to. But she was, and then another, another time when she found, realized that probably won't happen was she told me this almost in secrecy kind of. It was open, but she almost like whispered it. And she says, this sounds really bad, but I wish we got demoted in level so we would go mm -hmm. in the same grouping at world championships and be able to play against them so we could see them again. Thank you for the question and for hosting us, by the way. Back there, yes, ma'am, go right ahead. Oh, no. Okay, him, then her. Okay, that's okay, all. I'll, I'll go. Oh, no? First. Okay, all three of you. That's great. Let's pass it around. Uh, Anybody so else want to go before? <laughs> no, go ahead. I'll be fast. Um, I recall that in 2018, there were some criticisms about um, uh, the unified hockey team being um, the women's team and not um, the men's team. I don't know if that's based on a technicality, but can you talk more about why it, they chose the women and is there a more gendered reading that we're not aware of? No, oh, right. And basically, if you ask anyone on the women's team why they were chosen, it's because they were the women's team. Um, I remember talking to Marissa's mom, and she's at home in Minnesota watching this, and her first thought is, wait, why didn't they consider the men's team? And so there was this history of mistreatment for not only the women's hockey team, but women's sports in general in South Korea. Um, a lot of sports and sports entities are run by j in South Korea, so these very powerful conglomerates run by very rich, wealthy men who favor, you know, Male, more male-dominated sports, and among the South Korean players, they never felt like he uh, uh, respected them or even cared about them. One kind of figure that um, exemplifies that is you had players on the men's hockey team making almost like six-figure salaries with housing and cars. On the women's hockey team, the daily stipend was $50 a day um, if you trained 15 days per month. So you had to train 15 days. If it was one day less, you only practiced 14 days. You didn't get anything. And so there was always this very strong feeling of, you know, wanting to push back against this patriarchy, but forever having lived with just this disadvantage compared to the men's team there. Okay, let's go ahead and pass it up, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I wanted to make a quick comment and question. Ironically, I think on the travel question, it would have been easier for an American to have been go to North Korea than a South Korean. So right. Yeah. So it's a funny irony, but um, a question on the North Korean players and sanctions. Did you come across, I feel like this has happened in other situations where, for example, sporting equipments have been uh, occupied a gray zone in which they were considered luxury items right. and so potentially caught up in sanctions and were there similar problems for the North Korean hockey players and uh, yeah. their equipment and training, et cetera? This, some of the North Korean players came with like wooden sticks or very old models, so they were able to use pretty new equipment at the Olympic Games that the team already had on, had on hand. Um, but there were, talking to Scott Howe, the guy who runs the NGO, the Friendship League, he told me that he doesn't do it, but some other people might um, basically try to leave better equipment behind when they visit and just hope that people look the other way. And so there are, there are restrictions. There were um, 
even stories of the North Koreans going to like IIHF or other tournaments and just being gifted, you know, a gift bag of chocolate, and that's something that they can't bring back once they travel back. Um, so in terms of equipment, all, a lot of the South Korean players mentioned how they noticed they didn't come with very good or very new equipment to begin with, and so that was one of the things that immediately made them think our performance is gonna suffer. Oh, I thought the gentleman here, did you also, did I see? Oh, I never saw your hand raised? Okay, I was confused entirely about whose hand was whose. Uh, what are we thinking? One more question? Two more questions? Okay, who wants the last two questions? Uh, who's, oh, you were actually raising a hand. I thought you were just... <laughs> Go for it, Jenny. Sorry. I'm really falling down on the job here at this point. Go That's on. Sorry. Um, so, Seth, uh, thank you for being here. The book is great. I, I've read through it. Um, I encourage everyone to buy a coffee. Um, but, you know, one of the things, and you started to touch on this, of the actual discrimination against the women's hockey team and, and the sport itself. Um, and you do talk about it a little bit at the end, but if you could explain a little bit more of how, you know, when this was such a centerpiece of Korean politics and of the kind of Korean nationalist identity, how has this affected the Korean women's hockey team going forward? Right. And so a lot of the Korean players, right before the Olympics, President Moon actually visits Jincheon. And one of the reasons why was this decision to make a unified hockey team wasn't charting very well with the public or not as good as they thought it would. A lot of people thought it wasn't the right move and that the women's team was being put in an unfair position. And um, he comes and kind of goes to make amends but also get a photo, you know, wearing a Korean hockey jersey being around the women's hockey team. But the minister visited. A lot of these government officials would come visit them to try to smooth things over. And the women's hockey players always kind of felt like, we want what's right. We have something coming due to us for taking part of this. You know, we're making a sacrifice here. We're not going to forget about this after the Olympics. And so, as I mentioned in the book, and I'll go explain a little bit here, after the Olympics, there's this feeling among the women's hockey players of, all right, now we're going to get what's coming to us. And he is not kind of as receptive. There was a promise that there would be a women's hockey program created in Suwon, a city just outside of Seoul. And a lot of the players would receive training and games and salaries to be a part of this team. And when that kind of doesn't happen, the team basically threatens to boycott the upcoming world championship tournament, which takes place two months after the Olympics. And so you had government officials, Olympic officials, very worried because they want to keep up this image of, you know, this great unified team and what they meant and projected. And then if the South Korean women's hockey team doesn't show up to world championships, people are going to kind of wonder what's going on. So they take this very bold move, this move that in a way is very much rooted in kind of you could almost say a more Western progressive ideology. And in talking to some of the South Korean players, a lot of them said, we wouldn't have done this or even thought about doing something like this if it wasn't the import players. One of my favorite things about the book is over time you have this give and take, this sharing of ideas between the South Korean players and the imports where the imports, none of them really felt Korean before basically, but living in Korea, talking to Koreans and kind of getting that dose of Korean culture makes them feel much more strongly in a certain way about their heritage. And in return, you have South Korean players who not only are kind of fascinated by the West and America, but also hide many things. For example, there was one player who often struggled with depression, uh, players who were very, had questions about sexuality or other topics which they felt they couldn't talk about in South Korea. These are just taboo topics that you don't bring up or talk to even with your friends. But with the import players, they could be an open book and ask them questions and just spill their feelings out to them in a way where they felt much more comfortable discussing issues like this. And when it came to kind of the boycott, they felt that they wouldn't have taken the step to kind of push back against Kia and these men in power if it wasn't for the imports kind of nudging them towards doing something like this and saying, no, you're right, you should feel this way. One more question, I guess. Do you have anything, Mr. Kim? Oh, back there. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Melanie Sis, and I'm a, a member of the Stimson team. Also, I work on defense and national security issues. So I want to thank the, both of you and the council and also 38 North. I think one of the things I really 
appreciate um, that 38 North does is focus on these very human experiences that happen inside of all of the geopolitics. I don't know if people saw the on the way in, there's an exhibit that's very interactive, again, really accesses these human elements. Um, and obviously your work fits very nicely into that category. And so um, I, I'm curious about um, how the experience of doing this book, this writing, has shaped how you think about what you might like to do next. Are there elements of the experience that sort of inform how you look for the next thing that you want to report on and uh, sort of attach to that, what are you working on now? Wow, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, professionally, I'm still kind of, the book came out just last week and so I'm still kind of in <laughs> book, mo book mode for here, but I mean, I do, it, it, I, I always kind of wanted to write a book in a way, and so this was almost have your feet thrown to the fire just because of the rapidity of so much of this taking place and happening. Um, it was a very short timeline, um, but I do, it, it was challenging in the aspect of reporting and even talking to the players at times. I could always know I could talk to the imports phone, email, in person, just because it was very easy in English. Uh, a lot of the South Korean players, so half the team of the South Korean Nationals were teenagers, essentially. And so they took English class in school and were pretty well versed in English, but I learned quickly that they were very shy in speaking it. They just did not like to speak English. And so I would try to initially have these long, detailed conversations and just get like two word answers back. So I quickly kind of learned just to keep it simple with them early on. And then eventually I hired a fixer or translator when I went back to Korea to have that three, four hour kind of sit down conversations with them. Um, in terms of shaping me professionally, it does. I do, I did enjoy, as stressful as it was, I did enjoy this journey of writing a book. There are other books I would like to write. Um, it, it, it taught me a lot about just, basically you had 24, 25 characters in this book. And so a lot of what I was doing was figuring out which stories I was going to prioritize, um, what would the narrative arcs be of kind of the major characters, but still including to make sure everybody's story was told. So that was something I had never kind of done before. I had never written a newspaper article where I had to include 25 different names or characters and also just the backgrounds of all of them. So it, it, it was, sometimes I look back and I don't know how I did it kind of in a way. Um, I remember a professor kind of telling me uh, in journalism school, there are two people that kind. There are two kinds of writers. One is the kind of person who kind of plans everything out meticulously, and then someone who essentially just vomits it all out there and then mushes it all together in something cohesive and coherent. And I feel like I did a little bit of both with this, um, which I wouldn't recommend to people out there. Um, but I, I think it was a very good experience just to almost. It's almost like in journalism when they say you get parachuted into a story. And in a way it was this, but it was a very deep, deeply background, deeply researched, and also deeply personal thing to me. Um, I want to ask uh, as a final point about the personal, because we began with something very personal. And you mentioned along the way that reporting the story was your first return to, to South Korea and that you didn't have time to think about it. Now right. you have. Yeah. Having reflected on that experience, what came to mind? I, I still, my closest to connection to my closest connection to Korea, I feel, is this team. Um, there are 24 people that I care immensely about. Um, I like to. Uh, earlier this week, I had an event in Boston and New Haven, and that's where some of the players live. So I was able to catch up with them again. So when I think about Korea, probably my first thought is the team and the players on the team. Um, in terms of my own personal kind of journey and feelings, I am much more prouder to be Korean, I would say. There are things about Korean culture that I'm much more in tune with. I feel I know much more about Korea, but I also don't feel very, I think, I'll, and a lot of the imports feel this way too, they don't feel quote unquote like Korean Korean still. Um, it's still an ongoing kind of process and evolution. I am much more prouder to say I'm Korean American, um, but if I go to Korea, I would still feel very much like a fish out of water there and um, not know. So I, I am definitely 
it, it, it's the book was something that if I never wrote this book, I don't know where I would feel or identify or kind of feel about anything about Korea, but it is definitely a much stronger attachment, at least that I feel I have now. Seth Berkman, thanks so much. Thank you. Well done. So we should send people over there for the book. So be, go for it. Yay, that was fun. So yeah. Hope that's what you wanted. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know oh, how no I couldn't problem. see the right person's hand back there. It just looked like a mash of humanity from where I was, I suppose. Maybe I was connecting. I think I want to get a picture of you for we Okay, that's fine. Oh, uh, hey, hey. I'm, I'm from West Lafayette, Indiana. Are you really? I am. Wow. Okay. Oh, that's and great. So, yes, and yeah, also, let me know. I'm Any questions? I'm part of the fan club. Okay, yeah, thank so you. I'm going to be really obnoxious. Awesome. Oh, yeah. That's not obnoxious. We are amazing. We